Hey there, rocket scientists. Actually, I'm addressing myself, believe it or not, kind of to uh, a humanities professor, say a literature professor, or history in college, college level, let's say. Uh, but a lot of what you talk about is also very accessible to high schoolers. I mean, what do you need to be in college to listen to a lecture? You need a high school education. And then maybe to actually do the math and stuff, or whatever the math is. You know, write the poems that has, you know, I have big pentameter, whatever. Uh, write the history, do the research, get the footnotes. You know, there's a lot of work involved in getting good at your profession, which is defined by your peers, and you try to be a role model as such a professor. And what I'm helping you do here is cross the famous C.P. Snow chasm uh, across a bridge now that we have in American literature. And you're more likely maybe to know of the C.P. Snow chasm if you're in the humanities, although we could run a poll. We could see, you know, get name recognition, do some kind of question buried in a bunch of others, figure out who knows about that chasm. Is it more humanities people or is it STEMites? Now, STEMite is a funny word, and I will take credit for it. In this version of the slides, I'm going to take more credit. Like, I invented some things that are funny, like Siberia. Maybe other people invented Siberia with a C like that, but I take credit. I thought of it, too, before I saw anyone else do it. And um, DENSA, for Recovering Mensaholics. So what I'm going to do is not confine myself to the slides, and I think this is more realistic if you're any kind of lecturer in a college anyway, on Zoom or whatever you're on, right? You're showing, projecting, and talking at the same time. You're not going to just need one PowerPoint. You're going to jump back and forth. We've all seen a million demos, right? So if you've got a YouTube channel, I always, you know, when I was inventing YouTube, I called it the Video Grammatron. It was based on Sesame Street having such short segments about the letter A or the number 12. You always knew if you were bored, something new was coming, and soon. And if you weren't bored, you could look for repetition. You knew that thing you just saw was going to come back. So that was my inspiration for YouTube. But of course, I didn't call it YouTube, nor am I going to be given any credit for YouTube. But the idea was in the air, just like for, for hypertext in general. Right, I was always interested in hypertext from reading uh, Ted Nelson's book. A lot of us were. So we feel like we invented it because we dreamed it into existence. And that's, you know, we helped, we, we could see it coming. And I think Fuller knew that's how the zeitgeist worked, but he wanted to reinforce the Emersonian point of the worth and the ultimate worth of the individual as the source of all the that we consider civilization, really. Now, it takes groups of people. It takes more than one person to get the synergies. And so there is no doubt that we need a lot of people. But the question is, uh, can we write off the person in favor of, say, a fake person like a corporation? And Fuller was early on planning to make the banner of individualism his banner. And so he started patenting early and often, if he could, major things, right? And nowadays people get upset. It's like, how can you actually patent the geodesic dome? I mean, it's found in nature. And didn't uh, so-called uh, Walter, not he's not so-called his actual name, well, maybe it's Walter Bowersfeld, right? In Jena, way back in 1922, had a planetarium idea that looks like a geodesic dome. And yeah, of course, these are in pure principle things. That's the whole point. They're in the zeitgeist. And all of us are geniuses, and we can all pull this stuff out. And this whole game of priority, and it's like, no, that's mine. You can't use it. you got to pay me to use it. That's my idea. Fuller knew he was going into that kind of a world. Unfortunate for all of us, right? Like Alexander Graham Bell, he's really into the so-called Octet Trust, which Fuller got a patent on. Stupid, right? How do you patent the face-centered cubic lattice? You can't. But, you know, you, you went in Rome, right? 
So Fuller was being prescient. He was saying, someday when I become controversial and people want to attack me, right now I'm just this gentle genius, you know. I'm not a threat to anybody. But someday I might be, and they're going to try to tear me down. But look what I've done. I've already got all these patents. You can't deny my originality, right? And they try, right? Even today they're trying. Because they don't really think it's convenient right now if you're an Erlen professor, say, in a Quaker college, even in the humanities, to be giving a lot of credence to this kind of offbeat math that the math department itself is under instructions to not touch, as we've seen, right? 40 years of nothing. So, like, the word is out. <clears throat> it's death to your career if you dare say anything positive about the math of synergetics in math. But we're not in math, right? We're here in literature doing it because you have to be able to read like philosophy kind of stuff to understand what his point is. And that's <clears throat> what you're seeing here on this slide, right? The meaning of 4D per, for, for Fuller. The meaning of 4D per Fuller is what I meant to say. It's his namespace in synergetics. It's not Einstein's. It's not Coxeter's. They have their own namespaces. And they say 4D, they mean something else. And no one has ever told you that probably. And because that's because, like I said, it's um, the Stemites have not embraced this. And that's because, here's answering my first question, I think this is more the invading hordes coming over the bridge. The CP cell chasm has a bridge now. And we're coming from the humanities side. You know, um, Harold Bloom, Richard Rorty, Muhammad Ali, Kiyoshi Kurumiya. You know, we are coming as activists even over this bridge into the Stemite territory. And we're already well versed in this kind of math that they don't know anything about. And that's, but it makes sense to us, right? Because it's so connotative. You know, the way it's written, it's prose. It's written in an associative way. So even though there's all these nuggets of tetrahedron stuff, and even though we have all these artifacts, and so we can do hands-on, and we can learn a lot of geometry, we can do it in the context of poetics. You know, he's the, what is it, Elliot Norton Chair at, of Poetry at Harvard for a bit. Like, he's on that list, right? Um, he's an American transcendentalist. So we get to have best of both worlds. We can anchor ourselves in the humanities. You can be an English major. And, and yet, when you take this course on the Bucky stuff in American literature, you get this bridge to STEM for free. And suddenly, you're in the world of sphere packing and volumes and all this kind of cool polyhedron stuff. And you shouldn't be that surprised because philosophy has always had this stuff. And now, do you have a stash of YouTubes? Here's my next question. They shouldn't have to be long. Like when I do, like, the concentric hierarchy, for example, it might just be 40 seconds, right? Or this one. This is the birth of some kind of animated GIF, perhaps. Right? How long is this one? This is 40 seconds, right? So in building up your YouTube uh, stash, you're thinking ahead to when you're at a, a podium. Well, good afternoon, School of Tomorrow students. But maybe not literally a podium, right? Because you're doing what I'm doing. You're producing video content. But I'm just saying keep it multimedia. Keep jumping around between your slides and your other exhibits. This is my recommendation. And I'm inviting you to use these slides as you do that and to teach this very content. Now the T and the E module, that's a whole discussion. It links to subconscious demon as an index term. Go check that. I think it's probably listed under subconscious demon in the index. Because it took a long time for Bucky to, to discover this little difference here between the T-mod and the E-mod radius of 0 0.99948. You know, it's a very small sliver of a difference. And you're saying, well, what, so what difference does that difference make? Who cares? But don't you find it interesting? Because platonic geometry, like we're doing here, it's totally a tautology. 
we've switched to Tetra volumes. No one knew you could do that or seems to care. But now that we've done that, we have a very interesting set of math facts that we're playing with. And it just so happens that this little sliver between T and E is there. Okay, what significance to attach to it? We can debate, we can talk, but interesting it's there. And interesting that only we who study synergetics know it's there. So you can have a hairline fracture in your geometry that's of interest to you here in the humanities and not be bothered justifying it to like uh, some panel of particle physicists or something. Like uh, what right do you have to, like this is all free of charge anyway, right? In terms of it's already just published literature. You don't need to do fancy experiments. You know, we say synergetics is empirical, and yeah, it's based on your lived experience, trial and error and all that, but there's a lot of it that you can investigate and explore without the benefit of a fancy lab, but it does help to have a computer. And here again, I think the humanities needs to shoulder a lot more of what we're doing with language, because... What about version control, for example? Why aren't all federal and uh, state laws of every country kept on version control systems and stuff like that? You know, basic infrastructure questions. And I think it's because <clears throat> you get lawyers growing up in the humanities who don't even cross the bridge at computer science and they just don't develop the skills. They don't know how to use Git. But, you know, it makes so much sense if you're writing legislation or important documents of any kind that their version control approach be understood and the branching and the merging and all that. So another reason to jump into the Bucky stuff from the humanities side is that we are offering a lot of those kind of skills usually associated more directly with STEM. That's where I get STEMite, right? People who live in STEM world all know how to program, at least that's the stereotype. But what about HTML? Isn't that more like punctuation in a lot of ways? Like semicolon, colon, and now there's all this other stuff, the tags. Why didn't humanities pick that up? That's what poet Gene Fowler wanted to know. He wrote his own, this is a guy who'd self-taught himself enough Delphi programming that he could sit there in his 70s and write an XML typewriter is how he thought of it. Because this is, you know, the punctuation of the future. But everyone's gotten so so specialized, see? And that's partly why this very interesting and important content does not get shared and why you're in such a great position to share it yourself now because nobody else is. That's precisely what makes it a niche for you. So get ahead, you know, get yourself a vector flexor. I have a big one. Here's a little one. Where's my big one? I have my big one. It's right over there. I'm always recommending that you have some show and tell items. Right? And you don't have to wear a hat. Lionel did one. He wrote back or did a YouTube back at me using my slides and wearing a hat, which I think was above and beyond the call. But you can, if you want, associate synergetics teaching with hat wearing, male or female, or anything, right? You could just make up a style, cosplay encouraged, if you like. It's up to you how you want to weave in my YouTubes and your slides or my slides and your YouTube. See, here's Alexander Graham Bell. Trump talked about him in his July 4th speech, as well as taking over the airports. And I've got pictures of this airport stuff, right, with the octet truss, I did think at the time it was a missed opportunity. It's like journalism is one unimaginative step away. If you don't take that step, it's very unimaginative. So there's one step away from jumping into a lot of interesting stories about American history and about another coordinate system called Caltrop Coordinates. Again, you can play with this in the humanities as kind of a warm-up and with lots of connotations and associations. Don't tamp down on that stuff because on the synergetic side, we do think metaphorically, and that's quite fine. 
It's not about stripping out all the resonant frequencies and just meaning that one literal thing that you mean, right? It's not. It's more like you're used to from reading, you know, T.S. Eliot or whatever, right? We keep our meanings in play. We can, we can boil it down to a literal meaning on some axis, but ultimately, as above, so below, right? We're looking at analogies a lot of the time. And so the analogy of three inner perpendicular axes to four, five, and six uh, perpendiculars, can't we just call that a metaphor? Because, you know, right? It still works on paper. And, you know, we can be a little more flexible that way and make some more room in our thinking for quad rays and more room in our thinking for already having two meanings or three meanings for 4D. It never did shake down to just one, right? There's this sort of extended Euclidean meaning, and there's Einstein. So for Fuller to jump in with the third kind of 4D, this should just be limbering up. We understand there are namespaces in this world. We don't all use the same language all the time. Every discipline has its shop talk. And we don't uh, disallow, like, I can use the word gravity, and it can be, you know, not as connected for me to neutrinos and the weak force, which is, you know, a little stronger. Maybe my gravity is more connected to, like, graves and gravitas, and there's all this other English around the word gravity. And how does my gravity in kind of a phase space connect to all these meanings? And it's going to be the same as yours? No. Especially not when we're thinking metaphorically like in synergetics. So gravity and synergetics and radiation and synergetics and synergy and entropy. These meanings develop as you read the language, right? It's not like there's a set of definitions because we learn, and even a lot of physicists will agree to this, that the way our concepts develop their maturity and meaning is in their usage. And a single definition doesn't magically compress all that meaning into a few sentences. It's helpful, but really it's more helpful after you've already watched the movie, right? It kind of helps you summarize what you've learned. That's what a dictionary helps you do. And there is a synergetics dictionary, four volumes, because, you know, what I'm saying here is that Fuller used words that we're used to using in somewhat different ways, and even multiplication, and even volume, and even... How do you uh, multiply two numbers, right? But that's not supposed to scare you off in math. In math, you're supposed to run towards such things with open arms, excited. Oh my God, something new. Something interesting. Like, did you know that a cube of all edges R has the same volume as a right tetrahedron with all edges 2R? And by right tetrahedron, I mean you've got this book, a triangular-paged book with only one page that flaps back and forth between the open covers. And when that page is vertical, straight up, perpendicular to the two book covers that are lying open flat, in that position, the volume of this tetrahedron with all edges two, right? That's what we say D is. That volume is the same as this cube over here, but with half-sized edges R instead of D. 2R equals D. Pretty interesting, right? So this would be what we would call a unit of volume, let's say. You can look at either that cube or this right tetrahedron and say, aha, that's XYZ unit. Now you move that flap over, so we got a 60, 60 uh, degrees everywhere on the faces, that is. And you've got your other, I would say, leading candidate for a unit of volume. And then you've got the ratio between them. And that's kind of how we go in synergetics, is we go with the tetrahedron of all edges D as our unit. And it actually works out. We actually have a consistent math here. But put it in quotes, math in quotes, because the mathematicians have shown very little interest in the whole thing. So I want to bring it into sort of math as in polymath. Like you don't have to be great at math to be great at this math. 
right? You don't have to know differential equations and algebraic topology and, you know, differential geometry to be good at synergetics because it doesn't demand your, it demands your right brain as much as your left brain. It's not a Bourbaki project. Right? So you just have to understand how it is we can speak differently if we wish about such ba basic things as dimension and get away with it. Well, in math, you can get away with different axioms. They're called like namespaces. So we understand the in intuition that Darcy Thompson's going for here in this letter to Whitehead, right, in 1918 letter to Alfred North Whitehead. Why don't we say space is uh, 4D? Think of it more in tetrahedral coordinates, and it's very prescient, right? Bucky would probably have never seen that quote. Nor, I doubt, did he ever have time to get into this Carl Menger stuff, even though it was totally contemporary. A lot of times we don't see things happening in our own time. They put it together later that all this stuff was going in parallel, like Alexander Graham Bell and the Octet Trust, which is this CCP, FCC, IVM, whatever you want to call this space of the flatworms. So if you do teach synergetics, are you guilty of sharing metaphysics and have you um, become a member of a cult? And is there a belief system here that is going to make you a pariah? And those are deep questions, really. I mean, with any author, say um, Socrates or Milton or Pythagoras, uh, especially like Pythagoras, there are cults, but so Socrates, you know that Plato had a school, right? So these questions about what am I getting into if I do start teaching this stuff and what will happen to my career, I'm not saying easy answers here. I'm not, but I am suggesting, especially if you're in a Quaker school, you're probably safe because you got wackos like me out here who've already, I'd say, opened the space for this kind of a lecture without too much hullabaloo. You can follow in my footsteps. The fact that nothing's really bad happening to me, I mean, I'm just getting a lot of clicks you could say people are interested you know people just happen along in my youtube channel and like wow all this stuff i never learned it's kind of interesting 40 years of nothing about most of what i'm showing you here and doesn't that grab your attention to some degree and um sort of flip that around wouldn't it be fun to teach it yourself as part of what you do not as all of what you do right take whatever walk of life you're in especially if you're in, say, literature and philosophy, and just drop this in as something that you're going to get more versed on, right? And I've got all these materials for you. I've got uh, GitHub. If you get into GitHub, right, even in the humanities, like I'm suggesting, don't leave it to the Stemites to take advantage of, of version control, right? So the skills that you can gain Owen Python, right? I'm getting into it here in this channel and in general, and I'm not saying Python in particular, but in general, as you roll through this curriculum, you should feel free to, you know, introduce a computer language. And the one I've got going is Python, and here's our unit of volume being tested, and um, then you can go to the A modules, the B modules, you got your plane nets, there's a lot of cool geometry. And at the same time, you don't have to be a math major. Okay, you can be a computer science person, whatever. It's like it's so open what your actual walk of life is, and that's a selling feature. So check my other presentations of these exact slides, right? That was pretty cursory. They're all cursory because I don't want to, um, you know, do it the same way every time. And there's so much to say that to try to put it all in one presentation would not be that smart either. So every time I do this, I do it in a slightly different way. And that could be the, the pattern you use as well, right? I'm not trying to teach a specific song and dance. 
I'm just trying to give everybody a sort of set of tools where you can go out there and join in the fun of sharing your own heritage, American heritage, world heritage, right? It's all there for you. So come on and play. See you out here in the swimming pool.